Hi, welcome to the Society of Antiquaries International Women's Day celebration. My name is Susan Morrison. Um, I should point out that as part of my celebration for International Women's Day, I created four PowerPoint presentations. I was very proud of them on my laptop. <clears throat> and then I promptly dropped my laptop from a great height and smashed it to pieces. And so instead of PowerPoint, we are going to have to explore these women's lives through the medium of uh, storytelling and modern interpretive dance, if it all gets a bit complicated. As I said, my name is Susan Morrison. I am the presenter of Time Travels, BBC Radio Scotland's history magazine programme, which is fantastic. Sometimes people say to me, what is a history magazine programme? And I say, well, it's a, a magazine uh, about history, uh, but it doesn't have a problem page. If anybody out there wants to work on that, that would be a very interesting concept. So I'm going to take you through the stories of three women and a group of women. They all have something in common, apart from the fact that they're Scottish. They all looked at a problem or problems and sought solutions. They all thought they could change things. A woman who thought she could change her life and did. A woman who could change other women's lives and did. A group of women who thought they could change lives and the world and did and a woman who could change political thinking, and did. Amazingly, these women sometimes sought solutions to problems that would never be addressed in their lifetimes or even solved, which to me speaks of tremendous courage, tremendous verve, and tremendous imagination. And finally, I think the thing that all of them have in common is they are also slightly terrifying. Uh, I've got the presentations here, uh, but what I think I would love to do as well is if there are any questions, please, fire them in. I should point out again, I'm not a historian, but if I don't know the answer, I can definitely find somebody who does. So let's go and look at some of these remarkable women who shaped the world that we live in today to celebrate them here on International Women's Day. Probably one of the books that had most impact on the 20th century is the Communist Manifesto. And the very first line of the English translation from Marx's original German says, a spectre is haunting Europe. I suspect it certainly was, incidentally, that was a time of tremendous revolutionary fervour throughout Europe. A spectre is haunting Europe. But in fact, that isn't the original. Original. There was another translation from German into English before that. And that, that translation's line is, there is a hobgoblin stalking Europe. Which I think is far more impressive, far more frightening. You can practically see the hobgoblin tearing up cities and streets and throwing cobblestones. A spectre is kind of a wraith-like creature. Hobgoblin is solid and angry. And that line was written by the original translator and it was a woman. Her name was Helen McFarlane and she was a true dyed-in-the-red revolutionary. At least that's what I like to call her and I think I'll explain why she was died in the red as we go through her story. She was uh, a young, bright woman, highly intellectual, very highly thought of by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And she was in London around about that of 1840, 1847, 1850 time. She was unusual amongst the revolutionaries because she was Scottish and she also had seen revolution on the streets. She knew what it looked like. She'd seen that blood. She'd heard those screams. She'd watched the dragoons ride down civilians. So she knew what she was talking about. And I'm sure that must have given her a certain edge with the Revolutionary Brothers in London and sisters in London at the time. She wrote for a newspaper called The Red Republican, which was owned by a guy called Julius Haney. Now, and its masthead is quite scary. And it says liberty, equality, fraternity. And, you know, it might be quite big on fraternity, but only for the boys because... Surprise, surprise, she had to use a male name when she wrote for the publication. But she's still considered very highly by the comrades, by the Brotherhood. Now, in the 1850s, 1850 is a bad year for uh, the revolutionaries. The revolutions have been put down all over Europe. They're, they're basically on the back foot. So Julius Herney, who owns the Red Republican, decides that he's going to throw a party for the comrades. And um, it's a New Year's party, it's going to be a New Year party. Um, and the highlights of the party will be tea, a ball, 
and speeches from British Democrats. Now, if anybody's ever been to a left wing shindig, you will know that speeches from Democrats are going to take a long time. So this party is not karaoke, okay? It's going to be quite a serious event. So Helen goes along to this party, but someone else comes to this party and her name is Mary Haney. She's married to Julius. And like Helen, she is a Scot. Uh, also, I won't surprise you to know that the left back then split just as much as the left now. Helen and Mary don't like each other. Mary, you see, is the daughter of Ayrshire Weavers. Now, I don't have to tell you about the radical tradition of the west of Scotland. And Mary Haney imbued the actual essence of working class fury and, and revolution completely committed to the cause. Well, she didn't like Helen McFarlane. She didn't like this revolutionary scene, uh, the destruction in the streets of Vienna, who wrote so well for the Red Republic. She didn't like her at all. Perhaps it was an accent. Perhaps it was the way she drank her tea. But Mary knew that Helen was not a daughter of the working class. You see, Mary knew that Helen McFarlane was no struggling child of mill workers. In fact, Helen McFarlane was the daughter of mill owners, prosperous mill owners. Helen was born in 1818 uh, into a family just outside Paisley who owned a turkey dye mill. Turkey work, turkey dye work, uh, was immensely profitable at this time. Turkey dye is incredibly strong. It can be washed, it can be dried, it can be pounded on stone. It really is hard wearing. Essentially, it's the denim of the time. And Helen's family owned two mills, actually, and they also owned an extremely nice, um, fashionable townhouse in Glasgow. She seems to have had a very happy childhood. She was one of several children, a couple of boys. They all went to university. They're so well educated, by the way, that they go to Germany to study chemistry. And Helen goes with them, which is undoubtedly where she perfects that marvellous German. Everything is going very well. Helen will be expected to marry oh, a rising lawyer or a, a young merchant until 1842, when Helen's father dies. And that's when the family discover, to their horror, that they are broke. The bills haven't turned a penny for years. He's been racking up the debt right, left and centre. And in that fashionable townhouse in Royal Crescent in Glasgow, that is where Helen has to sign away everything, all the property, everything. Her brothers and sisters have to sign all the way. Now, the brothers are all right. The brothers have been educated. They have degrees. They can go and get jobs. They can start careers. But Helen has nothing. So Helen only has really one option because she speaks such good German, uh, and that is to become a governess, which is what she does. She becomes a governess and she goes to Europe and she goes to Vienna and she's there in 1848. She is actually there when she sees that rising being ruthlessly crushed. So she sees all of this, but she isn't she isn't a member of the struggling proletariat. And Mary knows it. She knows what's happened. She says something to Helen at this party. It sounds as if she insults the husband-to-be of uh, Helen McFarlane, Mr. Proust. She says, Mary refers to him as a cleft dragoon. We're not entirely sure <clears throat> what that means, but it could be a reference to the dragoons that were putting down the revolutions in Europe. Whatever is said, the two women clash and Helen leaves the party. And Julius Haney does not defend her, so she just leaves. Karl Marx himself, who it will surprise you to know, actually has a bit of a hand in writing really, really bitchy letters. He writes that Hearn is an idiot, that uh, the bright star, the rare bird of his publication has gone and he did nothing about it. And incidentally, Karl Marx is a bit snide about Mary. And don't forget, she is a daughter of the working class, but he seems to think that she was just in the wrong. Helen seems to have disappeared and it took the amazing work of David Black and Dr. Louise Yeoman to find out what happened to her. Tragically, what happened to her was that she did marry Mr. Proust and they decided to, to go to South Africa. Helen's brothers had already emigrated to South Africa, so there was a chance of a new life. There was a daughter 
Consuela Paulina, and she's named after um, a, a, a hero of a George Sand book and a French feminist. Th this couple are hit deep in revolutionary thought, okay? So they decide to leave Britain, they decide to go to South Africa. I suspect Mr Proust's health was already failing and that was the reason they were looking for warmer climes. But tragically, he doesn't even leave British waters. He dies somewhere off the coast of the UK. Helen continues to South Africa, but mere days after she arrives, her daughter dies. And so she's left alone, widowed, bereaved. And she decides to go back to England. And she goes back to Manchester. And this is this is the interesting thing. She's in Manchester at the same time as people such as Mrs. Elizabeth Gaskell, who's writing these huge books uh, such as North and South and Mary Barton about the, the condition of the working classes. And it's tempting to wonder if these two women ever met because Helen's story is something that could have come from one of Mrs. Gaskell's novels. Whilst she is in Manchester, she meets, as women would like to say, she meets someone. Um, Reverend Wilkinson, he's, this is 1854 by this time. He's a widower. He has 11 children. But she takes them on and they, they get married. And then they're moved from Manchester. And there could be a good reason for that. They get moved to a place called Baddeley, which is a very small uh, parish outside of Manchester. Very, very nice, very country, very rural. The Reverend, you see, could have been one of those troublesome priests. The Church of England in the north of England has a lot of trouble with um, socially aware vicars who are causing trouble. And one way to deal with it is to move them out to more rural areas. So they move out to Baddeley, which is actually where Helen has her two children. She has two sons. Too. That's a huge brood. But sadly, um, at the age of 41, Helen dies. A tumultuous life. A short life. A revolutionary life. But why should we remember Helen? First of all, she was the first person to translate the Communist Manifesto into English. And there may be some people who wonder if that's a reason to celebrate, but I think it is. But we should also look at Helen's beliefs. She had a strong belief in equality, and that included uh, women voting. You practically had to pick up Karl Marx off the floor at that one. She completely believed in the nationalisation of land and industry. She uh, held that there should be nations with no slavery. But most importantly, and most interestingly, is Helen's marriage of communism and Christianity. She was a woman of great faith, so it's not that surprising that she did end up as a vicar's wife. And although I'm not a person of faith myself, I still admire her writing on the subject in her words. Those who take a man's life and use and drain the spirit from it are not being merely immoral, they are being blasphemous. I think the power in those words is, is still remarkable to this day. She was a thinker. She was admired by those who knew her as someone with an excellent brain. She is someone who blazed the trail. And yet again, we have someone whose great achievements were overwritten later by a man. So that is the reason, those are the reasons why I believe that we should, we should celebrate Helen. I think for one thing, you know that there's a townhouse in Glasgow, in Royal Crescent, and I think we should be getting a plaque up to the first person who translated the Communist Manifesto from German into English.